Hi there, and welcome to the Hub, a Junior Golf Podcast. I'm Ryan Burt, joined as always by the founder of the Junior Golf Hub, Roger. Nick Roger, great show coming up today. We'll have uh, one of the, the, the most well-known and best uh, coaches in America, Chris Como, will be our uh, guest today. So certainly look forward to, to picking Chris's mind as he has coached uh, from the, the very, very best players in the world. And he, of course, has uh, many juniors. Uh, under his fold now. So he has uh, run the gamut and get his thoughts not only on uh, his job as a coach, what he likes to do, but uh, where he sees the direction of the game. Uh, let's start with the game a little bit, the Solheim Cup. Uh, it is completed and the Cup remains uh, with Europe. And of course, the Ryder Cup uh, gets underway uh, later this week and throughout the weekend. And we know uh that's one of the great events in, in all of sports and in Rome, Italy, uh, going to be really fun to see how that all transpires. Might have to get up, up early in the morning, but uh, nonetheless, a uh, Ryder cup is on the horizon and Solheim cup uh, now, once again, in the books, your thoughts on the Solheim cup, Roger. My thoughts were, you know, what a fun event to watch. I actually got to watch a little bit of it uh, this past weekend and, um, you know, it's disappointing to see the Americans not, you know, get the cup. Uh, we had a good chance, had several matches uh, up uh, in the singles yesterday that uh, unfortunately we kind of let slip away. But, you know, 14-14 end uh, tie, a little awkward in the sense of, man, is it a tie? You know, that's, that, why did we play, you know, these last three days? But anyway, really good golf. It was uh, entertaining. Uh, definitely saw the fight in the European, you know, girls uh, coming back or the women coming back and, and fighting hard at the end. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be some disappointment there. I mean, I think there's going to be some questions on the team and, and where do we go from here and, and, and what happens with, uh, as we've talked about, Ryan, uh, the, the women's game, right? So, you know, where are we in the USA uh, with the women's game and who's going to be stepping up next? Um uh, how deep that that roster is going to be. So it's, it's, and, it's and fun, I think, yeah, but it's fun know, to watch. A reality of the Solheim Cup is it excludes, on paper, in your Rolex World Rankings, the very best players in the world. So, uh, you know, not a great sign. I'm, I mean, American women's golf is, it's it's been back on the rise. It's it's had a it's had a bounce back, but it also gives you an indication of how far you have to go. Yeah, no doubt. I, I wasn't going to go there, Ryan, but I'm, <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought it up because, yeah, there's a, I think there's a, there's going to be tough times coming when you're, we're talking about not having the best players in the world playing in that field. Um, and, you know, let's kind of start a, a president's cup, you know, what happens then, right? I mean, uh, if you take that to the women's game, <laughs> I'm afraid it, it, it would not uh, go so well for us. I'm, I'm sure. Although, People would say it didn't go so well for us not to get the Solheim Cup. So, uh, yeah, interesting for sure. Now, let's switch to the men's game and the Ryder Cup. Uh, do you have a prediction here? Certainly, Live Golf has uh, influenced uh, probably the European team more than the American. I mean, the American men's golf. Uh, I mean, there there is no uh, there is no second place. I mean, American golf rules the in in men's golf. It 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 rules the rankings and the best players in the world doesn't always mean they win the Ryder cup, but uh, right. the best players are American and it, and it American golf in the men's game is so deep that, you know, other than Brooks Kepka, who of course is a live player that, you know, really earned his way in with second place finish at the masters and winning the PGA that there was really no way to, to not have him on the team. But uh, you know, Dustin Johnson's been on these Ryder cups for a long time. Bryson DeChambeau has been on a few Ryder cup teams and, and those guys, I don't even think they got a look based on their, you know, where they play their golf, which, you know, that's Zach Johnson's determination. European golf, it's interesting. They're getting younger and better, but the names that have been around for so long, I'm not even sure if the PGA, if if, if everyone was still on the PGA Tour, if your Holters and Garcias and Westwoods would even still be on this team because, I mean, they're, they're just, they're, they're not as good as they once were. Yeah, it's, it's almost unrecognizable. I mean, you know, they had such stalwarts for so long. You know, the Ian Poulter, I mean, you know, those guys are not there any longer, uh, obviously. Um, I, I guess DeChambeau would love to have had like a, another week here. I mean, winning in Chicago this weekend, boy, maybe uh, that was a statement to say you should have picked me. 
<laughs> I mean, do you think other than the playing in the majors when they're playing against do you let's just say I'll give you a hypothetical that DeChambeau won five live events in a row and shot 59 three times. You know, true serum Roger, would he be on this team? How could he not be on the team? He would not be on this team. I, I don't think he would be, Ryan, but I would say, how is he not on that team, right? And I think that's a um, that's a flaw in what in in the system and what we're trying to create here to get the, the picks, but – um, I, I think, think next. I think next year. I think the year after next, uh, with Liv and this whole com, this this whole uh, common uh, ground that we're coming to. I think you'll see more and more of those players having that opportunity for sure. Um, they better play really, really well in the four majors. Uh, I, you know what? I think I it's going to be different. Five Ryan, I'm going to disagree. Event. I think it's going to be different. I think the Liv, this this new era of golf yeah. going forward. Um, I think it's going to be viewed differently. I think if it's we gonna, see it, if we see it, if we see it, that's true. It hasn't been passed yet. So if we see it, uh, but if we do see it, I think it's going to be different. I think it's going to be a, a, a new view uh, when it comes to where players are going to have the opportunities to play, uh, especially for young players. As a matter of fact, I mean, I think there's going to be an influx of players that, that can't make it on the corn Ferry tour or the PGA tour right now that may, we may see them go to the, the live tour for a little while and have that opportunity to come back uh, and go through European DP tour world or Asia. I mean, I, 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 found, I find it very interesting, Ryan, and I don't want to go too far down this tangent, but the Asian tour is supported almost solely by uh, PIF money. Right. And no one's talked about that. DP, to, uh, DP uh, World Tour also has a lot of PIF money that on the back end of that, no one's talking about it. But yet, somehow on the PGA Tour, it's these players are banned from playing uh, and having opportunity where not so much elsewhere in the world. Um, kind of a, an interesting, you know, uh, dilemma. But I think if they once they do come together, if they come together, to your point, I think we'll see it differently. I think you know. Going forward, the best players will come and rise to the top and get selected. As a matter of fact, I think the whole selection process may be accommodating for that kind of player. Would you rather have on the first tee on Friday in Rome, would you rather have Justin Thomas or Bryson DeChambeau? DeChambeau. Now, he's not a great locker room guy. Not everyone can, you know, not everyone loves on that team, not everyone is a big DeShambo fan. Uh, he's quirky. There's, you know, he's everyone loves JT, but you, you're not thinking team here. You're thinking strictly taking the better player. I, I'm thinking the better player makes the team better, right? I mean, and I'm not saying JT isn't. I mean, listen, obviously he's a, one of the best players in the world. He's a great guy. I'm nothing against him. I'm just thinking if you're looking at hot hand, you're looking at players who are going to potentially intimidate and in for four ball four ball um i think DeChambeau is is probably a better pick um i mean he's gonna put some pressure on a lot of people um he is he's a little bit more reliable i would think uh and jt right now in the state of his game and maybe that's kind of why i'm looking at it right now is just the state of his game is less reliable however he played really well last week and so who knows, right? So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this coming week. That's for sure. I mean, golf can turn on a dime. You, 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 it's, it's, yeah. You know, you see a guy that's missed. I mean, we have a guy every year on the PGA Tour that will miss seven, eight cuts in a row, and then top five. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Ricky Barnes kept his card on the PGA Tour for years by playing well in two events. You know, the right. Masters and and the U.S. Open. I mean, right. it's yeah, it's crazy. You know, good for him. Uh, so Victor Hovland. John Rahm, Rory McIlroy, you can certainly make an argument that they are uh, the three best players in the world. Uh, I mean, you certainly throw Scotty Scheffler in, but uh, the European, the, that Rahm, McIlroy, and, and Hovland, is, that is probably as solid of a foundation as they've had in a decade or more, um, but it does, it does drop off as it always seems to do at the tail end. Welcome in our guest now to the Hubba Junior Golf Podcast. Welcome in uh, 
the famed great swing coach, Chris Como, who joins us here on the hub. Thanks so much for, for joining us, Chris. And, uh, you know, let's jump right into it a little bit. Uh, certainly our audience, it's it's uh, the fastest growing audience in, in podcasts out there for, for junior golf, for golf really, as we're, we're serving that community that is so underserved. So let's just talk a little bit about, as before we get into to, you know all your accolades and great players you've coached, just uh, what what is your, your feeling of the state of the game right now with, with junior golf and young players in America coming up? Oh, you know, it's amazing. Golf is, is – I someone told me the other day they're, that they're in the um, – kind of like on the management side of it and more on the business side of golf. And they're like, golf is having, you know, a moment right now. It's having a thing. But then they corrected themselves. and like, you know what, though? I don't feel like it's this sort of like this quick moment. It, it feels like there's just been this uh, – almost like a tipping point of more people being introduced to the game and just interest – in the game at, at so many different levels and obviously the you know the juniors start getting into it whether it be highly competitive juniors or people just just kind of enjoying it at a very recreational level um for me it's super exciting to see um that's, you know, like we've all loved this game for a long time but to really see um just a very diverse population of people enjoying the game you know again in different ways um sure it's really fun to watch so you know i have a theory i don't know if it's true or not but my theory of why golf in the last five years, I, I believe that in the last five years, I mean, certainly Tiger's had an impact on the game that is undeniable. But as far as as athletes playing the game, uh, I think my theory is that concussions in football has directly led to an increase in the quality of athlete that the game of golf is getting. And what I mean by that is I think when – all the concussion data started coming out. Uh, you know, the the best in America, we all know that, that football is king. It probably always will be. But what you're, you're certainly seeing uh, in, in certain parts of the country that children are just not allowed to play football anymore due to the, the data that exists with concussions. And that quarterback on the football team that's also the best player on the baseball team, that's the best player on the basketball team, he is now or she is now being – uh, exposed to more golf. And I think we're seeing bigger, faster, stronger athletes play golf today than ever before, Chris. And, you know, we're seeing it at the junior golf level where we're seeing the scores that have never been shot before on the same courses that Tiger and Jordan and Phil played. Sorry, I got some background noise. Keep that locked for you. Uh, we're, we're seeing a, a different brand of athlete. And I'm curious, um, as you see these these athletes and, and families are seeking you out as one of the great coaches, are you seeing a different kind of athlete come to this game that wants to compete at the highest level? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think you see. Um, uh, it's, it's, I mean, golf's golf's interesting, right? Because it's this, it's this great balance between developed skill. Um, you you would take on one sort of end of the spectrum. You could say something like pool is a very sort of like uh, skill centric type of game, right? It's not like you have to be fast or super athletic per se. There's tons of skill that gets developed and there's some, you know, coordination that goes into that, obviously. And then you get to the other end, you know, maybe it would be, you know, whatever sport you would say is, is kind of like the, um, the most focused test of just like raw athleticism, however you want to find that. And golf is like really, it's in, in between the two, right? So you got to develop these skills, but obviously being somewhat explosive hitting the ball far having that sort of natural speed which can de get developed um is is helpful and yeah it seems like there's more people coming into the game at an early age that traditionally may have gravitated towards other sports i think that's an interesting kind of hypothesis of like uh you know the concussions um happening in football i mean definitely there seems to be a lot of people are apprehensive to have their kids play sports like that that where that's you know at a, at a pretty high risk level. Um, yeah. I mean, we're definitely, you're just seeing more people, right? You're seeing more people come into the game, wanting to learn the game. And I think within that volume, you're going to see, um, sort of a different distribution of, of you know, all the people that exist out there that again, might've been allocated to other sports. So yeah, I definitely feel like you're seeing more of that air quotes, um, raw athlete type of person, come into the game and learn the game at an early age and and what that's going to look like 
in terms of say golfers at the top level in 10 years, um, hard to know exactly, but yeah, it would be, you'd probably predict that you would get more, um, you know, people again, we would typically classify as that like pure athlete playing, let's say on the PGA tour or whatever it is. Hey, Chris, uh, it's Roger here. So uh, thanks for joining and uh, congrats on uh, Bryson's uh, win this past weekend. I, I assume you're hopefully uh, celebrating last night with him. Well, you know, I haven't coached Bryson uh, this year. I've been focusing most on my players on the PGA Tour, so I haven't been doing a live event. But it's funny enough, I was actually uh, in Chicago for some other stuff this last weekend, and I saw oh. Bryson yesterday. We were hanging out a bit, and... Um, you know, Bryson, we, we, we keep in touch and, and Bryson's so fun to always talk golf with. Um, he's doing, uh, he's always got inter something interesting going on. He's got some interesting stuff with club design that he's a rabbit hole that he's going down and it's really stumbled upon, um, a configuration that's been super helpful. So yeah, that was fun to watch. I mean, he's playing some really good golf right now. Uh, great. With, with that being said, so sorry, I didn't know that you weren't uh, still coaching, but that, that was great insight. Um, so as we're talking about the junior golfers coming into the game and the influx of athletes um, and you as a uh, super coach, um, I think one of the things that I get afraid of when athletes are coming into the game is how difficult golf instructors are making learning the game uh, for beginner golfers and even advanced athletes to get into the game. I think there's uh, what, what do you think about that? That how difficult they're making it? Is that what you said? Uh, yeah, how difficult uh, for uh, professionals who are teaching the game, I think, you know, because we, we've been so advanced and learning more about the technologies, learning more about ground for learning a lot about what's going on in the golf swing. And I think there's a there's a lot of, you know, teachers out there that you hear, or a lot of students, I should say, hear uh, coming back going, you know, golf is so hard to learn because there's so much to it. Uh, and are, are we making it harder for the, those who are, you know, coming into the game, learn the game? Oh, that's, I mean, that's interesting. I, you know, I mean, I don't know if you're reverse, say 15 years ago, before there was any sort of that technology and teaching golf, whatever, I think golf's always been hard to learn. <laughs> I mean, golf's, golf's a tough game, right? It's just like, uh, it's, it's hard to pick up a stick and hit like a, a good golf shot. So I think golf's always been. Um, considered a, a challenging game to learn. Um, that's one of the beauties of it, though. It's like once you start striking the ball, you know, halfway decent, it has like this captivating quality to it, you know, borderline addictive quality to it, where you're like, oh, this is so incredible. I experienced it because I, I took up the golf, uh, I took up the game pretty late in life when I was like, you know, whatever, 16, it's not that late, but still, it was like, I wasn't, I didn't grow up playing golf. So I, I mean, I still remember what it was like to really like learn the game and learn how to strike the ball properly. I think it's always been challenging. Um, you know, I think this is also where, in my opinion, like talking about what's influenced this sort of spike in golf, I think we had this big boom with Tiger as everybody, you know, like at our age can remember when, when Tiger came out and people were so like enthusiastic to like try the game out, whatever. But I think golf, golf had a little bit of like, a bit of a snobby attitude about it. It's like, here's golf. This is the way you play it. You got to like, you got to, you got to, you got to come to us and hear to, to the way we define golf. And a lot of people probably got turned off by that. And there's this boom. And then there was a downtick and we're having this second sort of boom of sorts. You know, you see a lot of athletes in other sports playing it, which makes, gives it a cool factor, celebrities, et cetera. But I also think just the different ways that we can play the game, things like top golf, or some of these simulator games, like simulator golf places. These are these are almost like an intermediary of sorts where here's a way to get interest, introduced to the game. There's not all this pressure at the golf course. You can hit a bad shot and it's still a lot of fun. You can socialize, you know, eat food, whatever it is. I think being able to introduce the game in, in different ways that can still be fun for someone who's at that very first level give someone the opportunity to stay in the game longer to, you know, move out of potentially that level. If they want to, and they don't, that's cool too, but move out of that level and then enjoy the game. And maybe it's more traditional fashion um, and, and, and develop the skill set to air quotes, you know, be a golfer in that kind of traditional way. Um, going back to your question about like the teaching, I mean, the, the idea is that if we understand more and we have tools 
whatever it is, like radar or force plates, whatever, whatever it is that that there's a certain level of wisdom in the teacher that that never gets to the student. So um, I, I guess I don't know exactly who you're speaking about, right? But I would I would argue that it should be actually easier and simpler for the student if the teacher is working with more information. That doesn't mean that gets to the student. The, the, the communication to the student should always be appropriate to where they're at their level or their sort of particular curiosity or their, their way of learning, whether they're sort of an analytical learner or they're not. The, 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 a good coach should tailor the message to that person. And then, you know, if they're using these tools, these analytical tools or these technologies, that's all behind the scenes stuff that's helping them maybe diagnose things quicker, but that doesn't in any way mean that that sort of messaging or that information gets should get the student if it's not the appropriate way to teach that person. So I actually think um, all this stuff should make coaching simpler, more efficient, and just more effective for the, for the consumer. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I was not not talking about, uh, about anybody in particular as a coaching style, just more of, it's just so much information that we have now uh, to filter to the player, to your point of making sure that we hit the right style for the player to learn uh, and hopefully communicate to them. It's just so much data now that you get on a player uh, that if you're not filtering it properly, it could it could make it harder uh, in a sense for a, a player to receive the information uh, just because. It's yeah, so but that, that, yeah, I would just argue that that just needs to be, you know, uh, on the responsibility of the coach and, and just better coaching on their part. But I, I've actually found from my experience that the coaches who are usually invested in that type of technology, they're super packed. That stuff's expensive, right? So they're super passionate. They're, they're really like investing in their craft that they oftentimes also have the wisdom to know that this information is not going to get to the, to the students. I mean, maybe there's people who, who do do that, but from, from my experience, most of the top coaches who are using that type of stuff, um, they're actually always trying to find ways to like simplify the message. Cause at the end of the day, it's just, it's, it's, it's about communication, right? It's just, you're trying to, and, and communication fundamentally is, is using the language that's going to resonate with that person in front of you. So if that person in front of you doesn't know any of the stuff, they don't care you pick a language that's maybe more fields and athleticism, whatever. If you get someone who, cause there are students out there who are on the forums, they're always looking at stuff and they want to hear that. So then you, you pick a language that's going to resonate with them. And that to me is just, you know, a fundamental aspect of, of good coaching in general. Chris, let's dive in quickly with, uh, with some of the junior game as there it is the largest body of golfers in the world. There are more junior golfers than there are professionals, more junior golfers than amateurs, more junior golfers than men or women. It's a huge body. And obviously, uh, in our world, they all want to play high school. They all want to play college. And then, you know, it, it, it obviously pyramids out to where only the, a very, very select few get to turn professional and play this game for a living. As you see junior golfers, and you, you kind of touched on it off the top, that you know, you're going to get different body types. You're going to get different uh, – some players, you know, spend eight hours a day on their short game, and, and they have developed like you would with pool, that they have really good short games but maybe not a ton of athletic ability. Then you, you may have other kids that come in there that just have innate swing speed that are, are swinging it at the same speeds that some of the guys in the PGA Tour are. So – when you get a player, what is your kind of, and you're so thoughtful on this, what is your first analysis that you make on a player before you start to think about how you want to try to get them to reach their goals? Yeah, I mean, if it's, it's somewhat skill set dependent, um, right? But like, I mean, typically you always want to have it work from like, a skills perspective backwards, meaning like, okay, what are the scores you're shooting? And for your goals, what are the scores that you need to shoot? So it's like, if you're shooting whatever, and then you want to play college golf or professional, it's like, okay, well, eventually you're gonna have to shoot this. And then you start to like open that up, right? You start to break that apart. Okay, so if these are the scores you're shooting, like how are you getting there? Are you a really good ball striker? but don't have a great short game or not a good putter or, or, you know, vice versa, you get a great short game, you don't hit it good. So, so now as you start to understand better, you know, how the person is getting to the certain outcome that they're getting to, and then what is the gap between that current outcome and the outcome that they want to get to to reach their goals, 
then you can start to um, look at those sort of components in more detail. And it's, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's, it's just a, a function of time allocation. Oh, you need to spend more time here. And you, I think you always try to start from the least invasive approach possible, meaning not trying to like mess with technique um, just for the sake of messing with technique. It's just like, well, maybe you need to practice better or maybe, um, you know, these type of games will sort of like target this specific skill set within, you know, sort of the skill set. For example, like, you know, maybe you're not a good putter and the reason why you're not a great putter is because your speed control is bad. So you got to do a bunch of speed control, speed control drills or whatever. Um, I do think, you know, sometimes you get to a point where you've exhausted all that sort of least invasive type things of like, how do you practice time allocation, et cetera. And then that, you know, someone's potentially hit a ceiling and their ceiling is not going to get them um to the place that they've defined that they want to for their goals whatever and then that's when you start to explore maybe doing more invasive things whether it be potentially a swing change or technique things um like that interesting and and then that that has its own kind of you know potential sort of diagnosis to it which you know it's probably outside the scope of this but that's where you start to really get into like why are you making a swing change what is a swing change you make or, or for what for what reasons etc um but it, it you always look at it, in my opinion, you look at it through the lens of what is the, the outcome you're trying to achieve. You're never trying to be like, oh, your swing's here and it should be here because I say so yet, <laughs> right? And it's like, that's silly. Like no one's like the, the owner of what a good golf swing is. I mean, and we've seen so many different swings, looking swings perform at the highest level on the PGA Tour. And, and you know, I'm always particularly cautious of what if a Jim Furyk or a Lee Trevino at age 14 came to me and, you know, because it's maybe a little bit air quotes different looking than what is potentially trendy in golf instruction. I mean, even, sorry, I'm just going on a tangent. It's just like even 20 years ago, what people talked about in the golf swing is very different than what seems to be trendy right now um, with, with, with what maybe some people are, are, you know, really liking golf swings. So I'm always cautious of getting like, a, a hypothetical Jim Furyk and changing that swing when it didn't need to be changed and then somehow being disruptive of that trajectory that, you know, obviously like the particular Jim Furyk went on. Um, but the other side to that is there is a time when someone, they have goals, maybe they have big goals and, and they're hitting a ceiling and they've exhausted all the other stuff. And then it's like, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta do something. <laughs> Otherwise this is kind of where you're at um, right. after you've given enough time, things like that, you know? Um, so, you know, this is, I, I actually think a big part of like really helping a junior on this sort of this labyrinth of sorts is, is the decision-making process of, you know, weighing kind of the risk and the upside. And, and again, that's all relative to a person's a person's goals. If, if someone is like, Hey man, I want to play on the PGA tour and that is my goal. And I'm not really worried about the downside side. You know, it's, 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 if their scoring average is 73 or 83, the outcome is going to be the same. You're going to have to go get a jobby job job. Right. So it's like, you might as well, you, know, you might as well, you might as well roll the dice a little bit. But if yeah. someone's goal is like, hey, you know, I, I just want to like make my my college team um, and their scoring average is 73. It's like, well, don't mess with that. <laughs> like you're, you're like right there. Right. So right. Like you don't you don't need to take on that risk. So I think it's this is a big part of like how you discuss with the person. You really get a sense of their goals and uh, yada, yada, yada. But but that that decision making process, I think it's a big part of, um, you know, the coaching student relationship in general. Chris, that's, I think you're spot on there. Uh, it all depends on what the goal is. So if you have a parent come to you and they have a young player, uh, again, back to our audiences, parents and junior golfers out here, right, primarily. Uh, so we want to get some information to them. So if they, you know, a parent coming to you with a 13-year-old who says, my goal is to be the number one player in the world, um, and your goal, uh, they want you to guide them or advise them on what to do, um, what, what would they do? What, where would you suggest, what would they, what would they start on? 
And they want to, they, they want to be like, where would they start clock? Jeez. I mean, I guess it would depend on, on I would, again, I would go through that sort of really trying to figure out where their game is at currently. Um, I mean, yeah, they, so you, I mean the first, would you recommend them doing an analysis? Would you recommend them? I mean, is that something you do? Uh, how, how does that work? So I just want to kind of get, uh, get a sense of, you know, I want them to have a sense of what, what's really happening. I, well, first, I mean, I, I'd want, I'd need to see their tournaments. I'd want to see like, okay, where, where, what t- tournaments are you playing in? What are your scores? I'd want to see like, what, where are they at currently? Right. Just yeah. again, without any sort of like, you know, all that other analysis still needs to be contextual to like, what, what is the actual outcome that's happening? What, what is their current performance? So I'd want to like see all their tournament stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I have an Academy over in Dallas, um, uh, at uh, um, it's it's now Ritz Carlton um, Hotel, and it's called the Nelson. It's a country club. And I got a team of coaches there, and we're going to be bringing in like you know, all the three D stuff, yada yada, all that, all the cool bells, like technology, whatever. And you know, so the first part would be figuring out what is, what are they doing um, in terms of their scores and playing and all that, and then it would be taking them through just looking at all their swing and all that stuff, just getting a sense of it. Um, and it would be partnering with a great coach, whether it be like one of my coaches or somewhere else, just finding them a great coach. And then, and then having that coach, you know, again, it's like, you want to start slow. You want to start least invasive and, and sort of taking them through this process that we just sort of described where it's like, okay, let's figure out, you know, why are you shooting the scores that you're shooting? And then how do we start with maybe time allocation in terms of you know, practicing more of your short game or practicing more of your wedges or your iron player, whatever it is, whatever we've, we've sort of identified as being the places that have the most room for improvement and then exhausting all that and seeing where a person gets and this constant kind of like, you know, turning this knob and that knob and, and, and seeing how good you can get someone without making any like massive swing changes. Um, potentially right and then and then and then you can start to you know eventually if, if if you feel like it's warranted depending on their goals go down that path of okay how do we build you um a swing that maybe you didn't quite do organically and then that's where i think some of the more technical instruction comes into place uh how about when you get in and, and obviously you've had a great stable uh you know certainly um you know, I know the story, obviously, behind how, how Tiger ended up, uh, you know, coming to see you. I mean, you're talking about the greatest player, you know, arguably ever, he or Jack. But uh, take us through that story, Chris. I, 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 what, was it, what was it like for you to be tasked with uh, the responsibility of this legendary, all-time, all-time great player who knows everything about the swing and everything about golf come to you and ask you, for your thoughts was, was it, was it nervous? Was it you, 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 you had your, you, you felt you knew some things that would, would be less taxing on the body. Kind of take us through that story. Um, so yeah, I, I would say going into the initial meeting, um, yeah, that was nervous for sure. I mean, it was just such a, like it was, it was like you're gonna meet with Tiger Woods and talk golf swing, right? It's just it was crazy. Um, but then once we kind of got into it, um, it's just sort of like my space that I've just been in for so long. So you just kind of you just sort of black out, and you're like in the moment, and you're just doing your thing. And you know, we started talking golf swing a bunch, and you know, my opinion, the way he swung it in 2000 is is probably the gold standard of how anybody swung a golf club, and you know, statistically, it was just the best ball striking we've ever seen. So and he, he's the one who's done it. So it's like you have that precedent. You have that reference somewhere in your nervous system at, at some capacity. So my goal was always like, how do we get you as close to 2000 as possible, but do it in a way that your body can now handle. And there was obviously like a lot of like subtle things in terms of the way to move the body um, that, that given his current set of injuries and, 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 and you know, obviously the, the sort of foreseeable direction with things that we were trying to get the body to move in particular ways. And, and that was, um, in essence, the, the, the objective of that relationship, like get the swing as close to 2000 as possible in terms of, you know, the way he would release the club, square the club, um, just the things that were probably more related to ball control and then do it in a way with his, like his pelvis and spine that could hopefully 
keep him um, as injury free as possible. And this is, I think this is actually kind of a good, I'll take you through just a couple different, you know, guys that I've worked with to, to sort of this whole conversation we've talked about. So, you know, in Tiger's risk profile, it's like the way he was swinging it at that time, um, his body was just, it was just banged up. So it needed to change, right? Um, a guy like Bryson, he didn't have any injuries. And for the first few years we worked, it was more about really understanding what, you know, we worked for five years and he, he, um, he won, I don't know, I think five times in the U S open and whatever. And it, it, during that stretch, there was, uh, an interesting kind of like arc to it. So when we first started working, it was more about understanding his particular sweet spot and when he, what, what he would do when he played really well. And he did, did great. I think he won twice with that sort of overall approach. And then he's like, you know what, though? I feel like I want to get to this next level and I feel like I got to hit it farther. So he went on this stretch of trying to increase speed. But from my perspective, it was always like, how do you swing it faster without messing up what I would call your release pattern, which again, I believe is, is a big part of what relates to like your ball control. So it was, it was always like, we can get more speed, but these are the constraints that we're working with. And that was really great. You know, he um, played really well in that stretch when, when the, when the U S open at wing foot and then, and then he got really into like hitting it farther and farther and farther, um, <laughs> which, which, I mean, that's just Bryson. He's just, I mean, he's just going to squeeze everything out of something. If he gets his mind into something, he's just going to, he's going to squeeze every ounce out of it. He, he learned a lot about speed. And then I think, you know, eventually it was like, okay, cool. Like I figured that out and I've explored that and back off of that. And now he's kind of back into a little bit more of, um, you know, I would guess, I mean, he still hits it so far, but just a little bit more focused on kind of like, getting back to some control, which is great. And I think it's where you're seeing him going on, on a really nice run right now. Uh, Jason Day, a guy that I've worked with for quite a while. Uh, here's another guy where he's got some back stuff happening. So a lot of it was like, hey, you know, you, the risk to, to make the swing changes is low because what you're currently doing, um, you know, he, a, a, along with some workout stuff and whatever, it was like his, he just, he didn't feel, he didn't feel good in his body and it didn't seem like, the trajectory of being able to play golf for a long, long, you know, many, many years going forward was there. So there was, there was a bit of the rolling the dice of like, okay, let's make, let's make some, some pretty significant swing changes. Um, cause there's not that much risk to it. Um, Timu Kim, who I've worked with for a few years, pretty good ball striker, um, you know, wanted to, you know, definitely had some tendencies where the shot, his shot shit would get too cutty, didn't quite hit it far enough. For him, it was like, let's make really the no injury. So it was like really subtle swing changes because you can mess them up, right? Like there's always that risk and he's already really good. So I'm super aware of that. Um, you know, I've been helping Tom Kim since uh, like the summertime. Same thing, good, you know, overall good, good ball striker. But it's like, let's find your particular sweet spot. No like crazy changes. We just got to know when you're hitting your best, what what's happening and keep you in that range more often. Um, you know, Pearson Cootie, I've taught him since he was 10, him and his brother, Parker Cootie, I, I coach Pearson only right now, but like, um, you know, I've worked with them since they were 10 and that was a, a kind of those other ideas where it's like, let's, let's identify the skill sets that needs to get better. And then over time we made subtle swing sort of evolutions. Like we definitely built, um, you know, built each of them respectively, like their, their golf slings, like to, together, it's always a collaborative sort of thing. Um, but it was always kind of like in that sort of phasic approach of like, okay, what's the, what's the current skill set? Oh, we're hitting a little bit of a ceiling. Let's maybe evolve this, you know, that next notch higher, but never just jumping in there and trying to make swing changes just for the sake of making swing changes. Chris, uh, you, you mentioned a couple times the swing profile and you mentioned the uh, risk, um, risk potential uh are, are, do you also do like a physical assessment so uh just kind of understanding like you know these parents are talking about going through adolescence or their kids going through adolescence of you know um hopefully reducing the risk of overuse injuries think things like that is that something is that what you're talking about with uh, risk potential oh uh, well, i'm also talking about the risk of like making swing changes where it, it actually undermines um 
some of their, their skill development where, you know, sometimes I'm probably speaking, like in some ways I'm speaking towards where um, there have been times where a, a junior maybe has a certain looking swing and then someone jumps in there and, and changes it because they didn't like that aesthetic and that actually undermines their overall skill development. But I yeah. think the risk, the risk aspect is, is what you're speaking to also um, where you're constantly trying to like monitor their body and how that's changing. And yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, on our team, we have trainers um, that are involved in doing assessments and, and helping the kids work out in ways um, that hopefully, you know, will, will help them perform better, but then also will reduce the risk of, of any type of injury or, or like you mentioned, overuse type stuff. Well, so yeah, you know, like that. It, yeah, because I, I, I thought I thought that's what you were talking about with risk as far as the potential changing a swing. But I just want to make sure the audience, you know, from a clarity standpoint that, you know, that was also something there. Because, yeah, we see it all the time where, hey, this picture of Tiger Woods in 2000 and, oh, let's emulate that. And, and the, you know, maybe you try to change it to look like that. But, you know, it actually negatively affects an outcome because you've just changed something that maybe you didn't understand what was actually happening. So just wanted to. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, and, but it, it's definitely both, right? I mean, but it is a yeah. risk of injury to it. And, and I, I mean, I think that's the cool part about golf is that the, the way a lot of the coaching programs have, have evolved, they're looking at this as like more of treating an athlete, kind of maybe to our earlier conversation. And, you know, we have trainers, and I think a lot of the good coaching programs out there have someone, either a trainer or, or, or someone on the, the physical therapy side or, or whatever it is, or both, right? And involved. And, you know, there's even a lot of great, like, sports psychologists. And, and golf is really, like, sort of the microcosm of life for sports where, you know, a kid coming up and learning the game, they can get introduced to all these other aspects of, of really personal development, which is so cool, which is, to me, mm -hmm. like, extend, extends outside of golf, right? It's like, you can go in there, you can learn about your body, how to stay fit. You can do some great mental training that can be extrapolated to, you know, business or any other sort of like pretty much any other life situation type of thing. Um, you, you know, there, there's some really great programs. There's a uh, decade. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's a course management mm -hmm. program. A buddy of mine, Scott Fawcett. So that's all about like, um, you know, understanding probabilities and looking at decision making from that sort of probabilistic perspective mm -hmm. um, that can carry over. And it's so many things right in life, whether right. it be investing or business, et cetera. So yeah. uh, the cool thing about golf is that, man, if you're, if, if a junior were to go into like all the different resources that can help with their development, their golf development, even if they were to like stop playing golf, they're going to learn so many things that are going to help them in life in general. And, and that's one of the things that I, I really love about um, how golf can be this incredible uh, sort of vehicle for, for kids and people in general uh, for just, um, you know, learning in so many other personal development aspects. Uh, last thing, Chris, and we'll let you go, but certainly, uh, you know, we see it now and I think you brought up some great points that, uh, you know, would, would 40 years ago, Scotty Scheffler's footwork would have been, uh, would a coach massively change that just because no one had ever seen someone's feet doing that. And the initial reaction would be that that's bad. And, and obviously for Scotty, it works really good, but let's, let's bring it to, to current times. Uh, you mentioned the cooties at a young age, you got them and, and kind of built their swing, so to speak. Um, for our audience that for the most part, it is uh, junior players with very, very high aspirations. It's, it's players that are, uh, you know, at this point in their career, they definitely want to play at the next level at college. And, and we're trying to help them do that. Uh, as they think about coaching, and maybe moving away from uh, their parents who get them started or moving away from uh, the super local guy that just is, is convenient. Uh, what would your advice, Chris, be on how you find the right coach that, that can improve your, your, your child's game and, and give you the best chance of taking it to that next step? Well, I mean, one – I think the super local guy that's convenient may not, may, may be a really good choice. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, the, 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 hard, the hard part is, is that there's so much good information out there. If, if someone, a coach is really invested in learning, like 
you know, there's different seminar programs, there's stuff online, there's different courses. Um, you have access to YouTube to study swings. You know, when I first got in the business, like that wasn't available. So I travel, I, I went to Florida and worked for Ledbetter for a while. Then I worked, worked for Haney for a bit. Then I went and worked for Mac O'Grady. And then I went to grad school for biomechanics um, because the information wasn't available. So it's like, that sounds super cool. And, and like, you know, whatever it's like oh yeah you went to grad school for biomechanics and did the research and it's like yeah but only because i didn't have access to it like it was just it was it was uh you know what is it the, and then it's uh necessity the mother of all invention right so it's just like i just didn't have an option but if i were coming into the game right now i wouldn't do all that because that information is pretty available you can take you know a biomechanics course that's going to capture kind of like all you really need. Like, you know, when I went to grad school, I would say, I don't know, eight, 80% of it was more of like the math and the heavy physics behind it that like, I don't need that. <laughs> like that's not what goes into my coaching. So I could have saved myself a lot of time and money just taking one of the really cool courses that are available now to learn essentially some of the fundamentals of like biomechanics or track man or whatever it is. So I think there's a lot of like probably, and I, I just think it's a mistake to always be like, oh, I got to go to the big name coach. I think there's a lot of great coaches out there that are, are super into learning. You just got to figure out if that's the person to partner with. I mean, if you found someone who you can tell is like passionate about the game, a coach, and they're, they're passionate about learning and they're staying current with like whatever research is happening and you have a rapport with them and you feel like you're on a good trajectory with stuff, like that's the person you go to. Like that, you don't need to find someone, some big name person, whatever. I don't think, I don't think that's uh, necessary. Um, now, if you hit a wall and, and, and I do think again, kind of on that point, I think people make a mistake where they, they're on a great trajectory and then, you know, all of a sudden they need to, they, they, they switch and they go to like whatever coach. It's like, no, that person that you develop your game with, they, they have a lot of information about you that's super valuable. So I think that you got to, you got to weigh that appropriately. That's, that's a, that's an important kind of aspect in terms of like someone just knowing you in your game. Uh, now if you hit a wall, that's a different thing. Then you can reevaluate. And how do you find the person to maybe help you get to that wall? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's the, the traditional, like there's the, the kind of all the fancy lists that are out there. You can, you can explore that or someone, someone who's got like a good reputation. Um, I mean, I don't know. Google search, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that is, right? But, uh, PGA but, to uh, PGA.com, right? Uh, get a PGA professional.com. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, again, there's tons of great coaches that aren't PGA professionals. So it's like, I, I think it's more about is the person passionate about really exploring sort of like all the things that are available out there in terms of you know, learning how to coach better. Um, and then if you hit that wall, I think you just find it, this is also sort of maybe just logistics. It's like, are you going to want to travel halfway across the country to see someone? I don't know. But it's like you find, you know, someone in your area that maybe has a good reputation that, 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 you know, you know, is passionate about that. But again, I think my bigger point is, is that there's people who are really great coaches who are passionate about it that maybe don't have air quotes of reputation yet. And if you're partnered with that person currently and you're on a good trajectory, yeah, I would say don't don't feel so kind of like, you know, eager to jump ship to the big name coach in the area because uh, the person who really helps you get there, there's a lot of value in, in their, their knowledge of your game. Well, that is uh, that is wonderful advice for sure, Chris. And uh, we really thank you for going a little uh, over time here with us today. But uh, so much incredible information for uh, these young and up and coming players and families across uh, the country and the world that listen to the podcast. So I uh, can't thank you enough, Chris. It really was uh, an absolute pleasure to prick your brain a little bit and, and hear some of your theories about uh, uh, the golf swing and, and ultimately uh, the approach you should take and families should take as they start this climb playing this great game of golf. So thanks so much for your time today. Thank you guys. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank thanks you. Chris. Hopefully we'll catch up soon. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That was Chris Como, Roger, and uh, obviously he is uh, he falls under that really, really smart. I mean, you can just tell that uh, he doesn't really do anything without running it through all the different variables, and and certainly 
Uh, you look at the stable of players that he's had. Um, he studied it from a lot of different levels and, and, and has a pretty good approach. Yeah, no, what I really like about it, there is no one method, right? And that's very um, obvious when you when you listen to him talk about how he approaches it, right? It's uh, It depends, right? And I think that's really important um, for actually parents and junior golfers and golfers uh, alike to, to understand. There is no one methodology that's going to fit for everyone. And I think his approach to how he, you know, does an analysis, find out what their end game is, you know, and then create an appropriate plan to, to work through strategies uh, to improve uh, is really, really important. No doubt. And uh, the juniorgolfhub.com, uh, certainly that is uh, uh, a wonderful asset, Roger. And, and as Chris is talking about, I mean, there, there are cases where, you know, we talked about it, uh, you know, at length with, with other of our guests that, you know, depending on where you live in the country, uh, you know, if you live in Texas, California, or Florida, there's going to be, you can, you can hit a golf ball and you're going to hit a, probably a, a, a coach that is, is pretty decent. Um, there are parts of the country where finding that right coach for your son or daughter who has shown a lot of potential and most importantly loves the game, it might not be so easy. So what is your recommendation if you are in the latter and you're having difficulty finding the right coach uh and maybe that you know, maybe the right guy is at the driving range maybe maybe that's not the right person to take your son or daughter to the right level uh next level what is your philosophy and and how can the hub help uh that process yeah no absolutely um well first and foremost yeah i think a lot of times you go to local pro you're going to find a, a really solid you know uh, person that's going to be able to help your game out right um, I would say the one thing is ask the question, are they going to assess them? You know, will they assess you both uh, from a golf uh, skill perspective, a physical perspective, and then maybe if there's a, a small uh, uh, mental screen, it might help, right? Uh, but there's a lot of resources. You can go to the juniorgolfhub.com, uh, go to the player development section. You can look up. Uh, we are actually putting in more and more coaches there that you can get certified, you know, not certified, but find a certified coach that can actually go through this process a little bit of what Chris just talked about, you know, kind of have somebody do an analysis on your game and understand where your skill sets are. Uh, so you can actually uh, create a, a plan of improvement. So that's there on the juniorgolfhub.com. Um, and then also another resource, great resource out there is uh, pga.com. Plenty of PGA professionals there. Look up coach. Uh, there are a lot of certified coaches now in learning, you know, in long-term athletic development. Uh, which is kind of the buzz out there right now is uh, something you want to look at from a junior golfer perspective. Well, Roger, this is a, this is a great story and a troubling story in one, uh, at my particular, uh, club, um, there is, a, a teacher now that for, let's say the last 10 years was one of the cart guys. You'd arrive, they'd you know clean your clubs, they'd get the carts clean. They they are a huge part of, of every golf course, and and you know certainly they know everyone, and they're in a very important part. Um, in about a six seven months time, uh, said guy has is now a teacher, um, and most of the students that I see, almost I would say ninety nine percent on a daily basis are under the age of 15. Um, he may be great. I really, I, I haven't, I haven't taken a lesson nor have any of my children. Uh, I know he's a wonderful person, but how, how do you know if your teacher is a good teacher, Roger? <laughs> uh, that's a great question, Ryan. I mean, been in this industry now 30, 30 years, um, I know traditionally to what you just talked about is what happens all the time at clubs, which is we'll take somebody who can go out there with junior golfers because the head pro or maybe the lead teaching pro uh, doesn't have the time. Their schedules are too busy. Uh, so let's just put somebody in front of these junior golfers, roll out some golf balls, give them some clubs and bang away. And in most times that's okay. Right. Uh, but the reality is, I've kind of taken that in a different way, which is I want my best resources on my junior golfers. If I want them to one, enjoy the game, learn the game, respect the game and become a lifelong golfer, if you will, I think it's really important to put your best people on it. 
uh, your most educated people on development. Understanding how somebody learns is really important. Chris mentioned that in, in his interview, um, knowing how to communicate with them, knowing that it's, um, you know, there, there are lasting effects here that take place. And if you don't know how to uh, disseminate the information properly, you definitely could make it more challenging than it should be and turn golfers away. So again, not knowing um, and not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but I, I think it's really important when you're interviewing coaches, if you will, is it understand what is their background? What is their, um, <laughs> does passion exude from them that they really love golf and they really want to help someone else enjoy the game? That's a different statement versus I've got somebody who's very passionate, who is a very learned person when it comes to golf technique, physical technique, the mental techniques, all of these things that he can bring a team together to kind of help him uh, grow and nurture a golfer um, and somebody who wants to be competitive. So it really depends on the, uh, if you're introducing them to the game, find somebody who is an op 36 coach that's certified and in, in bringing uh, the introduction to the game properly. That's a great, uh, you know, resource op 36. Um, and then from there, find somebody who is passionate about development, not just swing technique. And I think that's another thing that, happens all the time. If they're only talking about what this tour player does or, you know, she played like this on tour, um, you may want to reconsider. But uh, for the most part, they're passionate about the game and they want to introduce to the game uh, to a young player. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, but to Chris's point, you may get to a point or a level of golf or competency, as we would call it, to find out maybe more of the why is what's going on and to how do I change it until what kind of outcomes am I looking for? Wow. Uh, well said, Roger. That was, uh, that's been for my money. That was probably the best part of this podcast. So uh, thank you for that. That was, uh, that was really well said and, and well done. We thank Chris Como for sure. Uh, certainly uh, look him up on, on Google. And if you feel like uh, you really want to take a stab with, you liked what he had to say. Um, I know that uh, he does video lessons and things along those lines if he is in, in your neck of the woods. So uh, we certainly thank Chris. And as always, Roger, we thank you. Uh, we encourage everyone to head to the juniorgolfhub.com, uh, find out about tournaments in your area, find out about coaches, find out about colleges. It really is one stop shopping at juniorgolfhub.com. For Roger Nick, for our director, producer, Michael Nick, I'm Ryan Versane. Until next time, we'll see you soon on the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast.